Good evening, all. I am Pamela Jennings and a member of the Class of 78's leadership team. On behalf of my colleagues on the leadership team, I welcome you to our anti-racism town hall, an examination of everyday systemic racism and of restorative justice as its remedy with psychoanalyst, Dr. Dorothy Holmes. By way of reminder, we sent along a brief bio for Dr. Holmes and her CV and our invite. As far as careers in psychology go, hers represents the best of its kind, really par excellence. How can you love being a psychologist? Let her count the ways. She has expressed her gifted mind in scholarship, research, teaching, training, and clinical practice. Please take note of her scholarly focus on race and gender. There are real gems there. Also, let me personally underscore here that she is a distinguished teacher and has even won an award for teaching non-analysts. This is one of the reasons that I thought she would be perfect for this crew. Learners from all walks of life, of all backgrounds and races, of all religions, from the LGBTQ community and those from all social castes have found in her their Annie Sullivan. This is true in the sense that they had with her that first, aha, uh -huh. yes, I see what I am supposed to understand what you want me to connect in my mind to the words that will help me better navigate mindscapes. So my peers, when I left you guys in 1978, I was delivered into excellent hands. Dr. Holmes will discuss the case of Cooper versus Cooper, which is about the white female dog walker who called the police and falsely claimed that a black male bird watcher was threatening her as she walked her dog in Central Park last spring. I don't want to lose a lot of time to introductory remarks, but I do want to briefly say something about how our program took shape. We owe thanks to Mario Chiapetti for the idea Brent Shea and I were happy to join him as members of a committee charged with the task of developing an anti-racism program series with the full support of the class leadership. Early last July, Mario wrote the leadership team and said, open quote, I wish to pose a question to you all. I am not sure about each of you, but I have been consumed and upset for some time about the senseless killings of our fellow black and brown citizens by the police. Later in the letter, he asked us to reflect on a series of questions, including, open quote, is there something as a class we should do during this time? Close quote. Much is owed to Mario for the questions he put to us as a class. We can probably spend the rest of our reunions trying to find suitable answers to them. This town hall represents our best effort at this point. Hopefully it is but a promissory note to Mario that we will pay in full our debt to him for having the moral courage to challenge us in this way. Dr. Holmes will speak for about 25 to 30 minutes. Then we will be assigned randomly to breakout groups for a brief period of time where we can share narratives that were evoked by the presentation. I will say more about those uh, at the end of Dr. Holmes' presentation. Um, finally, we will come back together as a group to ask questions of our expert and make comments. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I share with you Dr. Dorothy Holmes. Thank you, Pam, for your warm and gracious 
and the thorough introduction of me. I am most appreciative. Um, uh, I don't want to get too sentimental uh, or too personal about this, but uh, Pam is very dear to me. Um, she is now a very dear friend and uh, a cherished colleague. We have uh, had a long journey together. Pam, I think I first met you in 1980, 79 or 80. And uh, I participated in in a way that was very gratifying and satisfying to me, her graduate education in psychology. She and I share many things uh, with mutual respect and, and mutual satisfaction. We're both clinical psychologists and we're both psychoanalysts. And I am privileged to have had a role to play along the way. Uh, what I often is most impressed with was how excellent her education must have been in Williams. She is such a astute and uh, agile thinker on many matters, not just psychology. And so it was a privilege to, to have her be part of my life for, for, for all these years. And, to, and so when she asked me to participate in this program, there was no way I could say no. Uh, how, how to say yes became the the opportunity and challenge uh, for tonight. So th thank you, Pam. I also want to give a shout out to someone else I think is in the audience who is dear to me, who I've known even longer than Pam since I was 16 years old. And that goes back longer than I care to count and won't reveal. Um, and that's Dr. Joan Seely, who is a uh, psychiatrist and, and uh, practicing still in Washington, DC. And she and I have had many a occasions to talk on issues related to tonight's topic. And in fact, uh, Joan, I don't know if you, you remember, but when we were both young and you were a preceptor uh, or had a, some kind of supervisory or instructional role at GWU psychiatry department, you invited me to talk on matters somewhat similar to tonight, which only says how uh, obdurate and stubborn these issues are. Um, and uh, I, th I think it was a, a worthy forum, but uh, I was somewhat of a firebrand then. And I, I hope that I still have passion about also maybe uh, a, a, a little more settled down. Uh, so Joan, if you are there, I appreciate your support. And I wanna say at the outset, in talking about matters having to do with race and racism, as a black person, it is uh, it, it it always is hopefully an opportunity. But given that these issues persist, and I've come to believe that they are permanent, it's only a matter of how we might uh, attenuate them and try to live by our better angels. Um, it is very important, I think, to most black folks to have support. Uh, so to, to be able to speak uh, truth to power and to be able to stay focused and, and clear headed, uh, one needs uh, the support of colleagues and friends and a point of view that uh, gives one hope even in the darkest of times. Uh, and. I don't know if our times right now are the darkest, but at, at times they are very dark. And to, to express what I'm trying to say on that point, I want to quote actually a hymn that I am very fond of. It's called uh, Higher Ground, I'm Pressing on the Upward Way. And it says, uh, my heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell uh, where those abound. My prayer, my aim is higher ground. So um, with that as my inspiration and a kind of grounding consideration, I will talk to you now for a few minutes on the subject of systemic racism and restorative justice. And the title I, that 
Pam and I agreed on was everyday systemic racism and restorative justice as its remedy. When I think about it further, I wouldn't say that exactly. I would say that restorative justice is a tool with which we can approach another tool as we try constantly to find ways to contain and arrest uh, malignancies of which I consider racism to be. We need as many tools as we can find and restorative justice is, is one of those. So I will, to orient us, I will say a few things about both systemic racism and restorative justice. What do we mean and what do I mean by systemic racism? Well, I think systemic racism requires that power across all societal institutions and across our country's entire history, power resides in and is under the control of white people. The power is maintained through all means necessary, undergirded by hatred. And that hatred is very, variously weaponized, for example, through disproportionate arrests and murders of Blacks. Uh, and a related, a related thing I can mention here that would illustrate this beautifully, and if we had a wide open like three hour forum or something like that, we might even show the film Just Mercy, but if any of you, if you have not seen it, I would recommend that you see it relative to the notion of disproportionate arrests and murders of Blacks. Uh, in, that, in that depiction, it, it's, it's uh, looked, through, looked at through the lens of incarceration and uh, uh, placing uh, Blacks and others on death row uh, disproportionately uh, well, let me put it this way. I think it's one in nine people who are placed on death row uh, and, and are executed are innocent. Um, but anyways, I looked, I, somewhat getting ready for tonight, I, I watched that film again and it's very moving. I would recommend it to all of you if you haven't seen it. So disproportionate arrests and murders of blacks and systematic limiting of opportunity uh, and full advancement for Blacks in many domains, including, but not limited to education, the workplace, housing, and healthcare. In my little syllabus that I proposed to be distributed, I, I gave you an example in the housing arena, which is a, a modern day version of redlining in which, um, it has been well established now through um, various surveys that uh, a, a black person uh, trying to sell a property will have that property appraised at about half the value that it would be appraised if the owner were white. Now how, and this goes I think to, to an element of the sickness of racism, because that practice hurts everybody. It hurts the appraiser, he makes less money. It hurts the community in which it happens because the tax base is adversely affected, which then ripples to uh, bad effects on education. It obviously hurts the family, the black family that's trying to transact uh, the sale of their property, their, their individual wealth is diminished. And it's a very common practice. Okay, so when I say that systemic racism is every day, when I thought of this audience, I meant to cast it in terms that, uh, or in language that is everyday language. I, I will ask you to indulge a little bit of psychological construction of this in terms of how a psychologist or a psychoanalyst would look at it. But
but largely I'm going to talk about it in everyday terms that I think would be um, accessible to, to everyone. Uh, in other words, no cycle babble or very little cycle babble. And so um, in that respect, I will offer you the following renderings that are not by psychologists or psychoanalysts. And I hope will be um, readily understandable to you. So the first one, I, the first thing I want to do is quote, excuse me, a congressman from the 1850s. A white man whose name is George W. Julian. Julian, J-U-L-I-A-N. He was a fervent, impassioned abolitionist, a white man. And he said, my fellow Americans, referring to other white men, my fellow Americans are emphatically a Negro hating people. Repeat, my fellow Americans are emphatically a Negro hating people. Now I'm gonna wind the tape fast forward um, to more than a century later uh, in 1980 something probably when President Lyndon Baines Johnson was interviewed and offered the following. And I, I imagine some of you have heard this. Um, he said, if you can convince the lowest white man, he's better than the best colored man, that white man won't notice you're picking his pocket. Hell, give him someone to look down on and he'll empty his pockets for you. Now, what is the relevance of that for this topic of racism? Again, I'm trying to promote the point that racism hurts everyone. And this is about, I think Lyndon Baines Johnson's quote is about how whites and blacks are deeply hurt by racism. So you have white people, maybe in, 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 in the current cultural circumstance, whites in Appalachia, whites in the Rust Belt, uh, whites who participated in the insurrection uh, at the Capitol on January 6th, uh, expressing themselves in racist ways, begin, believing that they are superior and advantaged as, as whites, when they may be poorer than many blacks are poor. And, and I think this uh, quotation from Johnson also speaks to another dimension of the impact of racism. It's not just economic. Uh, the damage that is done to blacks or to whites, but it's a racism not doesn't just empty your pockets, it empties your spirit, it damages your psyche, it spoils your soul. It's like soul murder. Um, so I offer you that for your reflections. And then I will uh, paraphrase something that I'm sure all of you have heard, and that is the uh, remarks of just a week or two ago, maybe not two weeks, of Senator Ron Johnson from Wisconsin, speaking about the hollowing out of one's soul and the, the selling of one's soul. When he commented that uh, on the insurrection, he said, uh, I wasn't afraid or, or disturbed or frightened by the act by those people on Capitol Hill because 
Those are law abiding people who love this country. Now, if, if and then whoever the commentator or the interviewer was, he said, I know this is gonna get me in trouble. And he was right about that. When he went on to say, now, if those people up there had been <clears throat> um, Antifa or Black Lives Matter, then I would have been afraid. So of course he got enormous pushback for this. And, but he didn't, he didn't budge. And I would ask you, perhaps when you're in your breakout groups, how would you understand this when he's pushed back and confronted and his response is, I wasn't talking about race or racism, I was talking about riots. And, and this is not a quote, but a paraphrase when he said, how dare you play the race card with me? Now, when I get around to talking as Pam announced uh, about Cooper versus Cooper, I will try to explain how he could come to that point of view and have a straight face about it. Um, I don't think it's just political opportunism. I do think it is that that this man is willing to say and do anything in order to try to secure his making it through his next primary. But I don't think it's just that. I think there is a way to understand psychologically uh, how he could separate himself from the obvious to many racist um, meanings of what he had to say. But so stay tuned. I promise to get back to that. Uh, uh, lastly, in this regard, I, I will quote um, <clears throat> James Baldwin uh, from Notes um, of a Native Son as to why in, in, the, in, the, in the, the societal structure and practice of systemic racism uh, why it's so difficult to dismantle it. And uh, this is what Baldwin, not a psychoanalyst, not a psychologist, uh, but obviously brilliant, said, I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their hates so stubbornly is because they sense once hate is gone, they will be forced to deal with pain. I, I will repeat that. It seems so worthy. I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their hates so stubbornly is because they sense once hate is gone, they will be forced to deal with pain. So I have <clears throat> said in my title to the paper that that restorative justice is, is one approach that we might try to consider. And the reason I, I do believe in it, um, and you know, I've been attuned to it as maybe many of you have since uh, the Truth and uh, Reconciliation Commission activities uh, in South Africa um, that started uh, with uh, Mandela and um, Bishop Tutu. Um, it's not that I think it's a panacea, that this approach is a panacea, but I do think we need to think of ways we can approach this very difficult societal problem that will have us be somewhat hopeful. So what are the essential essentials of restorative justice? And I, I you know, have, have read fairly widely on this, but I was trying to think of a simple, though not simplistic way of organizing basic considerations about it. And so I'm borrowing or adapting from McLeod's 2015 paper on reconciliation through uh, restorative justice, analyzing South Africa's truth and reconciliation process. That's a, um, McLeod is, uh, you, you can find the paper if you, if you Google it online. Um, 
the first element of restorative justice is the acknowledgement of the reality of systemic racism. If you cannot acknowledge the reality of it, then you can't make use of restorative justice. And I don't know, you know, I don't know to the extent to which this group struggles around that, or members of this group may. And I think, again, in the breakout groups, you know, hopefully we can invite one another or you will include one another, if not in a safe space, in a brave space to talk about how you really, what is evoked in you around these considerations. But the tool of restorative justice requires the acknowledgement of the reality of systemic racism. And again, I will quote uh, from um, uh, James Baldwin. Uh, this, and this quote is, is hard to trace because it's from an unpublished uh, manuscript, but it is largely um, attributed to him. Let me see if I can find it. Let's see, it says, um, um, sorry, just a second. Okay, here it is. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed that is not faced. And I think that is so apt. So, you know, using this tool requires one to face the reality of systemic racism. And in that acknowledgement, one must acknowledge and validate uh, the victim's suffering. And who are the victims? You might wanna consider that. Um, it's very easy for me on the basis of personal experience, long-term study of these subjects, um, academically and personally and uh, in teaching in my practice of psychoanalysis and psychotherapy, uh, it's, it's, it's very clear to me how much black people suffer uh, from systemic racism. But I think white people also suffer from systemic racism and that we, we need to acknowledge that. And how white people suffer Again, I will try to use Cooper and Cooper, Cooper versus Cooper to illustrate that a little bit later. A third element is that we try to need to try to reach for uh, beyond the suffering or in addition to the suffering, the recognition of common humanity. Uh, in the truth and reconciliation work, uh, they call that Ubuntu, it's a Zulu word, Ubuntu. And what does that involve? That involves something really very important and difficult as a practice in our country. I, I, I said that you know, racism depends on uh, the underpinning of hatred and weaponizing it in various ways. And the way that African-Americans get in the crosshairs there is because we, among others, are othered. You know, it, it, it's a derivative from colonial times when blacks were not even considered as fully human. This othering, the, the idea that you can find a group and decide that they emphatically decide and enforce that they are less than you. Um, and you know, the question has come up as to whether that, or to what extent, whether and to what extent that's implicated in the, the slaughter of the Asian women in, um, in the Atlanta area. So we have to come to or work our way towards a recognition of common humanity. And linked to that, then we need to promote a common connected future. Now that's a little bit euphemistic for the need to break down this practice that only white people have the highest level of power and wealth. The promotion of a common connected future. 
Another element is an emphasis on acknowledging and redressing wrongs done. Acknowledge, emphasis on acknowledging and redressing wrongs done and, and not be reductionistic about it. Not say, well, my family didn't own slaves. I wasn't a slave owner. Do I, the ipso facto, I don't have anything to do with this. That is a misunderstanding of the nature of systemic racism because systemic racism has power and wealth connected tightly and almost exclusively at the highest levels to white people, which is derivative from uh, slave owning and gaining economic benefit on the, on, on the grounds of keeping somebody else down. Another component is a de-emphasis de on retribution, on retribution. So, you know, that, that doesn't mean that people who commit heinous acts uh, shouldn't be punished for them, but uh, is that really the way to go? You know, the way we've used retribution, of course, is largely tilted towards over punishment of black people. But is the answer to flip that around and, you know, just use punishment of white people as a tool. I, I think that uh, the restorative justice approach just acknowledges some people have to be punished or arrested and contained and maybe separated from the larger society, although hopefully in the most humane way but is that really the answer to our to the issues of systemic racism? And of course, historically, and I think even presently, white people, many white people are very anxious that as our society is changing and we're moving from uh, rather rapidly, maybe in another 20 years, that white people will not be in the majority. majority. And is there, uh, a, a deep and abiding anxiety that what they have visited on others will be visited upon them. So restorative justice uh, does, does not emphasize retribution. It also requires that all stakeholders in the conflict are involved, including the larger community. Everybody needs to come to the table. And, and when I, I, I sent you those several pieces about uh, Amy Cooper and what has happened to her and her charges being dropped and so on. And then some on her behalf saying, well, this is our, uh, this is an example of restorative justice. Is it really? Did what happened involve all stakeholders in the conflict coming to the table, including the larger community? Or is that, is that a, a, a maybe a misuse of the notion of restorative justice. There must be an identification of obligations and solutions. Um, you know, what are the obligations that one assumes under this restorative justice mantle? Governing bodies acting on behalf of, must act on behalf of all of us and not for personal or partisan purposes. So I hope that puts in relief again, what I quoted earlier about Ron, uh, 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 Senator Ron Johnson, you know, how self-serving his, uh, his comments and then his defensiveness were. And that, that the hope, that the, the aspiration of restorative justice is that we create win-win outcomes so that everybody wins uh, and that, that the system it does not uh, repeat the, the winner-loser um, way of addressing matters. Okay, I, having said those things, I now will talk about Cooper versus Cooper. And uh, <clears throat> having um, introduced you to me and something of my style and the way I think and talk, if I introduce a little bit of, 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 of psychology to this, now maybe I've made enough of a scaffolding to do that. 
So, okay, as you already know, Cooper versus Cooper is the case of a white woman in Central Park who called the police on a black male bird watcher when he asked her to put her dog on a leash in accord with the city's ordinance. Now, I know some of you who may have followed this very closely as a human interest story and their different points of view. Uh, it is reported that he, he wasn't necessarily Mr. Nice Guy when he was asking her to do that. I mean, I, 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 but, but the point is, clearly she was violating a city ordinance and he was telling her that and he was telling her to stop violating it and put her, her dog on a leash. She became enraged and called the police in which she falsely reported that an African-American man was threatening her and her dog. What was the threat? And again, you may want to discuss this in your, in your breakout groups. I suggest to you that the bird watchers, the bird watcher was experienced as the othered, devalued one who dared uh, to express, to exert authority and demand that she, a white woman, and demand that she, a white woman, follow the city audience or ordinance. And that she could not accept that as coming from a black man. This was an unacceptable scenario for her in which she became flooded with anxiety and lost perspective and capacity for symbolization. And I want to introduce in saying that the notion of trauma. I mean, there are many ways to understand trauma, but I would offer to you that one way to understand trauma is that it is an experience that mobilizes a kind or degree of anxiety that blocks perspective and symbolization of what has been experienced and in which loss is experienced as loss of self. So I will say again, this was an unacceptable scenario for Ms. Cooper in which she became flooded with anxiety, lost perspective and capacity for symbolization. In that sense, she was traumatized. So I'm saying, you know, black, a, there's no question that, that black people have been traumatized over the whole course of this country's history around race. But I think we have more right, in a way more practice with how to cope with um, the breakdown in us when, when, when it occurs. We've had a lot of practice learning how to cope. And I ask you to remember the hymn that I mentioned earlier in terms of where we, we had learned to go. I think in a way, white people being called out about racism, having the, in a way being made to think about it is a newer phenomenon for, 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 uh, that, that has to be dealt with and leads to a lot of uh, discombobulation. It is important to query whether the bird watcher was really the source of Amy Cooper's trauma. I proffer that racism is essentially, is an essentially weakening set of practices, including for its perpetrators, making them subject to being traumatized. Othering and institutional racism are clung to because of the racist persons or racist institutions underlying economic advantage I mean, there's no question that racism as a practice has advantaged white people. At the same time, it leaves unattended the structural weaknesses in the personality, going back to our founding principles that said that all men are created equal while denying the humanity of blacks and women, a deep and weakening fracture from the beginning. The weakening racial, racial underbellies exemplified by disavowal and marauding ghosts of slavery and its legacies 
do not allow recognition of one's own racism, even when one is an extremist. So I think this helps to explain why Ron Johnson, I mean, if he were a well-connected man, he couldn't get in front of that camera and say what he said. But if you've split off your racial ghosts and the racial history, and you reside in your sense of supremacy and superiority, you don't have to account for yourself in those terms. In fact, you scoff at it and say, this is ridiculous. How could you think I was a racist? So Amy Cooper, even after she lost her job, temporarily lost her dog, because in her frenzy, rather than leash him, she appeared to be choking the dog. She also lost face. She still claimed, and she still claimed in an interview several days later, quote, I am not a racist. I did not intend to hurt that man in any way, close quote. This avowal was squarely back in place despite compelling and, and pervasive reality to the contrary. It should also be noted that the system did work better in the Cooper case, maybe a step in the direction of restorative justice. Mr. Cooper was not shot. She tried to leverage racial power and failed. Let that fact give us heart to stay in the struggle. As hard as the work is to do to remedy the deep fractures in our cultural, in our culture and in our institutions, let the work begin. There is an irony and a hinted at solution in the park incident. I've already revealed this, I guess. The white dog walker was Mr. Cooper and the black bird watcher was Mr. Cooper. Coincidence or providence? If only we could use their shared name as the promise of the shared humanity, of, of, of shared humanity and to respect and honor the truth and what a famous community oriented analyst of long ago, Harry Stack Sullivan recognized. We are all more simply human than otherwise. Finally, I say that when institutions and groups, including this distinguished Williams alumni group, examine race in the current high-pitched societal fomentation and do so by, allow, by allying with partnered, not othered ones and institutions, chances are improved to achieve better and more lasting solutions. Thank you for inviting me to your dialogue on such an important topic. Thank you very much, Dr. Holmes. I'm really excited for the uh, discussion and um, question period that's going to follow the breakout groups. Um, and I'm sure everyone um, feels like they have a lot of food for thought to take into the breakout groups. Um, what uh, Dr. Holmes um, talked about with Mario and I regarding the breakout groups is that they would make for a really good opportunity for people to talk about whatever um, narratives got evoked as uh, she did her presentation, including uh, narratives um, related to the uh, Cooper versus Cooper uh, case. Um, we thought that it would be important for people to be able to uh, talk about what got evoked from both a um, in both a general way, you know, general um, thoughts about uh, societal experiences, but also this is our opportunity to uh, talk about memories and thoughts that um, 
were evoked that remind us of our experiences at Williams. So the breakout groups, which are gonna be comprised of about five people each will allow for uh, that kind of um, intimacy. After the breakout groups, we'll come back uh, to the large group and um, have our discussion. So what's gonna happen is Ashley's gonna randomly assign people to the breakout groups. Um, enjoy, you'll be in them for about 20 minutes and I'll see you at the end of that time. Thank you. I don't know what happened with Christine. I'm going to try to assign her somewhere. <laughs> uh, in room 18 is asking for help. Hold on. So there's somebody in Linda Collins is asking for help in her breakout room. Let me turn on the chat feature so that people can chat with us. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if Christine's there, but if she pops in, do you guys see that, that there's a person? I just see Christine's name over here on the, when I click on the gallery view, I see, yeah. yeah. And it's interesting because she's not listed as an unassigned person, just the three of you are. So I don't, who knows what's going on, but if she pops in, then okay. <laughs> move her to a room but I can't I can't do anything since she's not listed as unassigned okay uh, so so I'm not sure hello hello yeah hello. can you hear me yeah I'm gonna get my picture back okay okay <laughs> hmm wait a minute let me see all right, here we Christine's go. in the waiting room, Ashley. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just did that because I was hoping it would then force her to become unassigned okay. and now she's gotten. So I think there was something weird going on with her computer. So anyway, now we're good. Okay, well, Dr. Right. Holmes, thank you so much. It was fascinating. It, it was really, really interesting. Um, and I think there will be a lot of discussion. <laughs> I yeah. hope so. Yes. Yeah, and it was, it was, um, it was very moving. You, and I, I think it probably everyone welcome back to the large group. Uh, we're going to start our um, discussion uh, question section. And what I want to do is um, invite everybody to think about this as uh, an opportunity to Make Pam, comments. Pam, I would yeah. give them one more minute because there's only nine people back from the oh, breakout room. Okay. So just just wait until the, it, it gives them 60 seconds to close up and I just don't want others to miss. So more should be coming back shortly. Oh, okay. Okay. Here they here they come. Just just give it a minute. I'll give you a heads up. Okay. Bye folks. Hello. Okay, you got a good critical mass back. Go ahead, Pam. Okay, all right. Welcome back everyone. So this is the final portion of our program tonight. And uh, we've come back together so that we can share with one another uh, some of the uh, thoughts um, and uh, experiences that got evoked by the presentation tonight and by your experiences in the breakout group. What I really want to stress 
is that this is an opportunity for people to make comments and share observations as much as it is an opportunity for you to raise questions uh, with one another, for one another, uh, for Dr. Holmes. But, um, you know, I just want you to feel freed up to participate in a discussion. Um, I'm going to um, uh, encourage people to feel free to uh, voice their own ideas and thoughts by raising their hand. Uh, Mario will be paying uh, attention to that and he'll let me know when uh, someone has something that they want to say. I will also be paying attention to um, any questions that get raised uh, via the chat. Uh, so let's just go ahead and, and jump right in there and get started. And um, I'll try to be as instrumental as possible in uh, the development of a really good discussion, okay? Um, so Mario, do you have any hands raised? Yes, Dave Simpson has a question. You said Dave Simpson? Hi, yeah. Dave. Uh, why don't you go ahead? He's muted. He oh, unmute, unmute yourself, Dave. Unmute yourself. Hmm. OK. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry about that. Uh, Mario, first of all, thank you. And uh, thank everyone for, for putting this together. It's really, really a great opportunity uh, and uh, means a lot to be able to participate. But the, our group asked that I share this, this one thought, which was um, trying to get a handle on how is it, how was it, uh, because we're all old enough to have lived at least, uh, you know, as young adults or teenagers through the, the late 60s and early 70s, uh, where there was a lot of talk about justice and, and racial equality and, and, and all these things, uh, that so few of the baby boomers ever put their shoulders uh, you know, to the wheel of, of, this, um, of these, of these uh, in furtherance of these goals and you know, wondering how, how will, can this change? You know? Will this be different somehow? Will this motivate people to, to incorporate these goals more deeply into their lives? So, okay, so you're, you're basically commenting that um, us baby boomers haven't been doing as much work on this as we could. <laughs> and you're kind of wondering what that's about. Um, <laughs> you know, that's yeah, an interesting. Yeah. It's an interesting question. I, you know, it, it sounds to me like a question that we might have some thoughts about ourselves. And so I wonder about um, asking people whether or not they have a response to Dave's uh, question. Um, and then we can also check in to see if uh, Dr. Holmes has any thoughts about that. But it it does seem like it might be something that, that we could reflect on and, and uh, share some thoughts about. I'll say something, okay. if I may. <laughs> um, I don't know the answer, but um, as white people, we don't have to do anything. That is the privilege that we have. We don't have to do anything except for our own personal, what do I want to say, our, you know, the, uh, the evolution of our own souls, if that matters. And I think people are busy. I look around at my friends and people are just trying to get by and do their thing and make their, uh, you know, and I mean, I pondered this question and even for myself. Um, but the bottom line is, I, I don't know. I don't know. I think, you know, I think recent events are, are good in that it is highlighting 
that racism, systemic racism, well, racism is real, it's alive and well, it's becoming increasingly more public and visible to all of us. Um, I don't know, I think we get the default of I don't have to do anything. There has to be desire, there has to be openness, we have to choose it, we have to want it. Um, two cents. Pam, this is Dan here. I, if I may, hi, I want to thank you for putting together this really important discussion and also want to uh, shout out to Mario, um, who is, as most people know, um, we're dear friends and, and um, thank, I thank him for the courage to advance this, to uh, put this uh, as a request to um, the class leadership and I appreciate the class leadership doing this. And I certainly want to thank you, Pam, for bringing Dr. Holmes into this really important conversation here. Um, I, there are two thoughts that, that come out of this. And just based on what Barbara said, um, I think there's a lot of, um, a lot to what Barbara just said. Um, the challenge that Dr. Holmes put to all of us is do we see the humanity um, in one another. And for those who have benefited from a system that says you aren't fully human, that requires work. What we had in our breakout session was a really wonderful coming together that Williams facilitated. This session is a part of leadership within Williams making the decision decades ago to be inclusive. And that was tough work. Um, just recently, I had a class conversation with a classmate and was absolutely stunned when a classmate reflecting on the Williams experience shared with me that why he and other white students thought the BSU was a horrible, evil place. Whoa. <laughs> He didn't use those words exactly, but it meant essentially he said it was bad. It wasn't a good thing. And the BSU is part of why I graduated from Williams. <laughs> it was my home. It was the place that made me feel validated and whole. And so one of the comments or two of the comments that were made from African-American participants in our breakout session was, it's exhausting being black in America. And I remember how exhausting it was being black at Williams and constantly having to justify your humanity. And I have spent 30 years as a consultant in the field of supplier diversity, working with major corporations, convincing them that it is in their best interest. It benefits their bottom line to do business with minority and women-owned businesses. It is exhausting. Today, I'm planning a presentation with my client to explain to employees why doing business with companies that hire disadvantaged employees is really a good thing. Particularly when some of the diverse suppliers in that company's portfolio are some of their best, best performers, best suppliers. So, I appreciate the fact that a good friend like Mario um, is a good friend because Williams created this environment. I appreciate the work he has chosen to do to go through his entire life post Williams in keeping his human connections, which include a diverse group of people. My question to my classmates is, yes, it is work. But what happens if we don't do this work? What world are we leaving for our children and our grandchildren if these kinds of conversations are not going to be something that they participate in, that they have, that they understand? What world will we be leaving for them? Uh, I, I will comment a little bit to say I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative and moved by the comments of both of the prior speakers and would link them to say 
that the, the gentleman who spoke so vividly and clearly, I hope spoke to you, Barbara, in terms of, you, you say, well, we don't have to, but don't you have to? When you listen to your own classmates and you hear the anguish, how, how you know, your black classmates express how it was, it's exhausting trying to be black in a white world of white people who don't have to, you know? So, and, and Barbara, you yourself said, well, except for your soul. Well, how important is your soul to save as well as whatever may be in one's pocketbooks? And I don't want to trivialize or minimize that you, Barbara, and your family and your community, you're working hard. You're trying to make it day by day. You've had to deal with COVID and so on. And this is one added thing. But it is, is it now at this time in our society that a thing we all have to add? And I want to, I want to herald and, 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 and show appreciation for this assembled group. I mean, you could be the beginning of something wonderful on this subject. Um, uh, the, 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 you know, you, you could, you could fashion your own restorative justice project, whatever you would want it to be. If I may, I just want to make one clarification. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I am fully committed to this work. I have read books, I have taken classes, and this is my passion project. It's, I think about it every single day. I'm looking for, um, I, I'm looking for more opportunities to be involved. I signed up for a 21 day racial challenge class. I signed up for a how to intervene if you see a racist incident happen. So I just wanna clarify, I'm totally on board, but I'm also clear that a lot of people are not, a lot of white people are not. And because we've been conditioned and programmed and we don't have to do anything if we don't choose to. So I just wanted to make that important right. clarification for me. And, and I think, I mean, I do think that that, I mean, that without maybe being aware of it, that kind of hints at like conditioning and learning. Um, uh, and what it is, you know, how it is that white people are seeing themselves, you know, around this. But I do think that there, it, there is um, a lot of educating themselves that whites need to do around how racism is really hurting them and damaging them so much. The, the emphasis is on, you know, what's the pathology that blacks suffer uh, from racism um, I listened to a um, neuroscientist do a lecture on the neuroscience of racism the other day and just found it absolutely stunning to hear him talk about um, the relationship between the brain and the fact that whites basically haven't interacted so much with, with black, like what's that, that has literally cost them in terms of, of brain development. And he was, you know, he uh, mentioned some research. Uh, this was a, a professor in Oregon, um, specialty in cancer. Um, his last name is Marshall. And I think like you, Barbara, he just feels very passionate about this. So he actually prepared a lecture for his colleagues on the neuroscience of racism. But he talked about this um, part of the brain called the fusiform gyrus. And it apparently is a part of the brain that is um, uh, critical to recognition, particularly facial recognition. And one of the findings of the research on this part of the brain is that people tend to show um, more, uh, their brain in that area lights up more when they're presented with the face of a person 
that's of the same race as them. So everybody sort of kind of learns to recognize the faces that are, you know, like most familiar or, or most like them. However, one of the things that was so fascinating um, was that he talked about how uh, white subjects didn't, did their, their fusiform gyrus didn't light up when a black face was put uh, in their visual, you know, in their view. Um, and he thought that basically that was very important information for people to think about and that it had implications for recommendations, for instance, to whites. And his recommendation was whites need to do a lot more interacting <laughs> with black people. And uh, they need, to, because they literally are not necessarily recognizing our faces as much more simply human. And when you think about that and you think about the police killings, it just, it, it like literally frightens me because I'm sort of like, who do these police officers see? I don't even know who they see or how they recognize what they, what they see. But it's, a, it's an interesting kind of finding. And I just think that, that there needs to be a lot more education so that whites even have a realistic picture of how much racism has actually hurt them as well. As as, uh, as us. So Pam, uh, Al Gentry's had his hand up for a while. Okay. Well, thank, uh, thank you, Mary and Pam, uh, and Dr. Holmes. Um, one of Martin Luther King's many uh, speeches, he commented after the Voting Rights Act was passed. He said, "White America got got away on the cheap." Otherwise, the point was. They gave us voting rights, but they, nothing else happened economically. It didn't happen economically. And matter of fact, the white community uh, prospered because there had been black communities uh, where we did our shopping and everything else. And then amazing now, I'm gonna say first, those young white kids laying on that bridge in Portland, I mean, that was just amazing. But here we are, for those who voted for the Democrats, we won the election. And don't you know, there are well over 300 jurisdictions from state, county, city that are doing everything they can for voter suppression. So black lives matter, but for me, a real estate developer, black economics matters even more. And I think when you take what Dan said and also what Barbara said, uh, we can do things, even if it is is uh, one-on-one is mentoring a young person to help them prepare themselves so they can go on to higher education. Or if you have an opportunity or access to capital or organizations, uh, making capital available, making capital available. I went to Harvard Business School. There's 2,500 black grads at Harvard Business School. So, so many of them have companies or can grow companies, which means hiring more people better healthcare, better housing, uh, better education. So we can do things and this is a great start. And thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> so um, Pam. Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. We, we, we have lots of uh, hands here and I know we're supposed to go off at 9 p.m. But um, Ashley just told me we could stay on a little while, no, sometime longer, just to um, maybe till 9.30 if people wanted to stay. Um, um, if Dr. Can, Holmes can, is unable to, to do that, but um, otherwise we have to stop at nine. So, so this is an open discussion. So but Sue Shred has a, Sue's been- I, I, can, I can stay until about 9.10 or 9.15, but okay. not to 9.30. Okay, okay. So Sue Stred, unmute yourself. Can I, I'm sorry, I just, can I jump in for a sec? I'm Nina, class of 80, um, crazy child at Williams, not so crazy now. Um, I think it was Albert who was just saying that um, the best thing we can do is to use what we have to elevate people who might not be in the same positions we're in. And um, I've done that in my life 
And it's really the best thing we can do. Um, uh, and it doesn't, and I've done it sort of across the lines. It's not, I haven't done it for black people or for males or for women or for LGBTQ or for anybody. I've just done it when I can do it because I have the ability to do it based on where I am at a certain point in my life. Um, and if we can just embrace what we, the, um, the ability that we have at a moment that we have it and share it out, um, I think that's the best thing we can do. Um, I'm sure there's much more we can do, but I think in an immediate sense, embracing what we can do and sharing it out is the best thing we can do. Thank you, Nina. Mario. <laughs> <laughs> so lovely to see you. Nice to see you, all of you. This has been great. Um, um, I do want to, we do have one question in the chat that I want to um, put out um, there for people to consider. Um, this comes from Kate Stone Lombardi. And uh, she asks us to consider, or basically she says- We, we can't hear you, uh, Pam. You can't hear me? Can you no, hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay. The people in our group want to know more about restorative justice. Are you talking about it as part of the criminal justice system? What do you think are the pros and cons? Does Dr. Holmes think that Amy Cooper's sentence was appropriate? Actually, uh, uh, we have, we've been exchanging on the chat about her question. Uh, okay. so, 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 but let me say, uh, Along the question of restorative justice, I gave you one reference, the McLeod paper. Um, as I said, it's a tool, it's not a panacea, but I think it goes to the question of our values. You know, I, I agree that each of us as individuals should do what we can do uh, and, and to do it faithfully. I do think there is an effort that is needed to change the larger systems um, uh, that are in place. And you know, restorative justice is not just about the criminal justice system. It's about all the systems that I referenced, you know, how education is impacted, how housing is impacted, how the workplace is impacted, uh, and it, it impacted and infected with racism. So, you know, depending on wh where we sit in, in our own values and where we are poised in our positions in society, we may be able to make larger uh, contributions. A as to Amy Cooper, no, I don't think what happened. You know, I gave you those uh, several references about her. And as I understand it, uh, her her, eventually her charges were dropped and, and I thought that was a sort of glib and cheap use of the notion of restorative justice because not everyone came to the table. I don't know there was any requirement that she and Mr. Cooper talk and that they talk with the police and that they, you know, really hammer this out. It's not at all clear what, what she was able to state to allocute as to what she accepted as her obligation and responsibility in what happened, and similarly for him. So, you know, I think it's kind of cheapened the notion of restorative justice to, to, for her lawyer, I guess, or her representative to say, well, we we didn't go for retribution; we went for restorative justice because there were no specific steps related to sp uh, restorative justice that were identified, and. Uh, <clears throat> But it doesn't mean that she didn't suffer. And that's not really the point of restorative justice. The point of restorative justice is to take advantage of something rather horrific like that that happened for her and him and our society and try to turn it into something 
that is educational, uh, spiritual, um, emotional, and um, to help her and, and, and him and all of us benefit from the situation. All right. Uh, one of the things that I think about is it, there was no restorative justice because nobody asked me what I thought, <laughs> meaning, you know, the black community was deeply affected by what happened. And so, um, you know, and, you know, it's the kind of situation that makes black people very anxious because it, it really could have ended up in his, in, in Mr. Cooper's death. Mm -hmm. And my feeling is that there should have been some way that she um, interacted with the Black community and took some responsibility for this and showed some understanding of how far reaching um, uh, it is, actually. But it was a, it was a, it was a, you know, a deeply um, affecting uh, moment for most of the people I know uh, who are black. I mean, people talked about this all day, that day at least, uh, you know, it wasn't something that just happened to an individual out there. It happened to all of us. And that's, I think, part of what people have to understand about racism. So Pam, we have a, a number yeah, of we, I see, I see several um, hands raised. I'm just, I'm gonna start calling them and just hope that we get to everybody before the uh, end, cause I don't know who came First, but Stred's been out there for a while. Sue, Sue's been out there. So who? Sue Stred. Hi. Okay, uh, so we could do Sue. Thank you. Um, I was one of the folks who was really um, convicted by um, everything that happened last summer and the summer before, and have tried to be helpful and be out marching and contributing and so forth. But it did cause me to to really look at the question that had come up of what the baby boomers had been doing. And uh, this isn't an excuse, it's just a statement. Um, I, and I suspect others, had felt positive about the fact that I had no personal hatred against black folks and other people of color. I was not gonna join the Ku Klux Klan. I felt that we had moved beyond um, those kinds of things and could accept each other on an individual basis. And I think some of us were pleased that we had done great. I'm not like my grandmother who would just say anti-Semitic and you know racist things and that we had moved beyond that and was really convicted by the um, events of the last two years to learn about and move forward on systemic racism instead of on personal interpersonal racism. Thank you. Um, Cynthia, Cynthia Kirkwood, do you have your hand up or did you? Yes, it's a brown hand actually. Uh, I just wanted to say that I, I enjoyed the breakout and um, I think my colleagues were a lot more hopeful and active in a way than I am. Um, Peter Smith, a banker in Pennsylvania, actually working toward, you know, more, I suppose, equity for black people, businesses. Sarah Boyle in Stanford, very active in the church. The church seems to be incredibly active in getting people to do readings, getting speakers to come. And, and Jeff, who uh, is also a banker, and said that uh, he said that he and his coworkers, I believe, well, he said that it's, it, they have to be more than not be racist. We have to be anti-racist. And I suppose I was really pessimistic one because um, I just feel as though we are just in the same place that we were 50 years ago. You know, and I explained that I, I, I left the States in 94 and have lived in Europe since then. And along the way, I thought that things had been happening, you know, and kind of made assumptions that they had been until about five or six years ago. And I was reading reports about the, the economic disparity and the fact that, that, that um, college education and graduate degrees didn't seem to make a difference. And um, I don't know, I suppose I, I, I was hopeful in that it seems as though people and my the, uh, people in the breakout and I sort of agreed that people saw, yeah, when George Floyd got killed, 
you, know, you no longer have to explain to people that there is such a thing as systemic racism. And as Dr. Holmes said, that's the first step, you know, in recognizing that yes, this exists, because that is exhausting, having to make a case for that. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that. Thank, Thank you. you, and good to see you. <laughs> yeah, and thanks for doing this. I mean, I, I think that, that we, we enjoyed actually talking with each other. We ordinarily would not be um, talking about race or even meeting each other, actually. But, but yeah, just good to have a conversation about this, an honest conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Holmes, as well. Uh, Mario, any, who else? Yes. So, so we have uh, four other people. Um, I think uh, uh, Charles Sanders had his hand up first and then uh, okay. Betty and then Glenn and then Dan. Okay, and, so, okay. Charles. Hey, hey y'all. Uh, <laughs> I was in a breakout group with uh, three other of our classmates, Dan, Julie, and David, and another 1980 uh, of our J class, Lee Shackelford. And part of what we discussed, and it's, juxtaposing as far as what both Dan raised as far as humanity and also what Nina was talking about on an individual basis as far as of doing things. One was as far as we use the Amy Cooper situation and we looked at the matter and knowing that it wasn't just an innocent byproduct as far as her calling the police and how she weaponized as far as racism as to making the call to the police, not just simply calling the police just to ask as far as someone to stop, but she knew that she would have power over him by raising it to the police that here I am, a white female on the Upper East Side of Manhattan in Central Park, and I got this black man who you know really doesn't belong here, basically threatening me. And that she knew that she would get a quick reaction as far as from the police as far as by that. And so it was, it was raising the stakes as far as under those circumstances. And that is weaponizing race. But something which we also were discussing is as to, as people are saying on an individual basis and what Dan said, humanity, part of it is people recognizing each other as a human and also as an equal. And that's something, something this country has failed to do as far as for centuries, as far as particularly for black people. If you start off with slavery, if you start off with all the racist codes and things you're doing, the suppression as far as voting, as far as being able to live in neighborhoods in there. And two items which we indicate that would go a long way on the individual basis and something which is simple but still complex is recognition and empathy for each other, recognizing each other as people and empathizing and knowing that just because that you're a different race, you're a different gender, you are different locales as far as the country, that there's a commonality as far as between all of us as far as how and how we go about and do things. Thank you, Chuck. Betty? Thank Betty you. Keller. Yeah. Thank you. So um, I'm from the class of 80 and um, I thank you so much for, for organizing this and the breakout sessions were, were great, wish we could do two, but um, I wanted to respond to Barbara's um, comment that um, people feel like they, um, you know, white people can decide to not address this. Um, and people's lives are so busy at you know various economic levels. But also, um, it's easy to avoid seeing it. So I live in Vermont, but people in other northern states, um, especially in rural areas where there's not a lot of black people, can very easily totally believe that we're past racism. Um, my husband didn't think you know, he, he just kind of like, oh, you know, she's active in her church and one of the things that she does is you know this anti-racism group that she she's active in but there's not really racism so it's so cute that she's working on it you know in Vermont um but then you know starting I think three years ago you know the the various things that we've seen well actually no actually it was he started to think of it more when Obama was so stonewalled throughout his presidency um but then more recently with the violence that we've seen against blacks um, that's been video recorded. So now we actually do see it. Um, and um, I just wanted to um, say that we really need to figure out how to talk to each other because we, we don't know what each other is thinking. We don't know what's going on in different parts of the country. It's a big country. And there, there's so many different cultures within our country. 
Um, but I wanted to bring up, you know, another person had, a couple of people had brought up um, working in whatever way you can in whatever facet you can. And um, so I'm active with healthcare reform. And, you know, that, that blindness that we have, there was this, you know, great movie historical about why was the United States, you know, why did we have the healthcare system we have compared to Canada it was put together by two white people, one from Canada, one from America who were married. And I thought it was eye opening in so many ways. And then four years later, I find out, oh wait, they missed this entire thing about why there was so much opposition to Medicare for all when they were trying to get Medicare and they decided to just do it with over 65 because the insurance companies didn't mind losing those expensive people to take care of. They would, they would let, let that happen. Um, but Medicare was going to desegregate the hospitals across the entire country. And that was a huge F impact on why there was so much fight against Medicaid, Medicare rather, and I living in Vermont don't understand to what extent that is still, so, still something. You know, J Lyndon Johnson's comment about, um, you know, if you, if you can convince somebody he's better than somebody else, you can pick his pocket. That's exactly what's happening. If you can convince poor white people that they're better than poor black people, and the insurance that you have is so important, it's, it's better to have the insurance you have that's killing you expense wise, and that you can't even access it because of deductibles, but at least the black guy can't get it. <laughs> it's like, oh my God. So anyway, I just wanted to kind of bring those things together. Um, thank you for the time and the opportunity. Thank you very much, Betty. Um, I know we're running out of time, but there are only a couple more. Glenn, you've had your um, hands raised. Glenn Shannon? Yeah, so I, I and maybe I, I lost Dr. Holmes because I had a question for her, and um, but others can respond. I'm still and, here. I'm okay, still here. Good, great. So uh -huh. I, I think one of, one of the things to link some of these comments about uh, why didn't we do more and, and, and empowerment and the like. So I've spent a lot of time and resources around educational access and equity and also mental health access and equity. And what I find hard right now, and I really would appreciate your thoughts on this, is so much of my efforts, and I suspect many of our my peers, have been trying to bring disadvantaged people, underserved people into the existing systems and structures so they can benefit from those, including getting into places like Williams and and what I'm hearing so much now with structural racism is, no, 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 it's the existing systems that are the problem. And in fact, some, are, some of your efforts to support the existing systems and to bring people into those, creating access is validating those systems. And in fact, they need to be torn down. That's a tough message. I can tell you, you know, it's, it, and then it's, it's hard to think about then what do I do next? Do I, do I stop feeding the system? Do I stop participating in the system? But the system is advantaging people. Al talked about you know, moving capital to communities that haven't had it. Um, Nina talked about opening up opportunities that she could open up for people, which is largely what I've done. But more recently in the conversations I'm having, the thing I really struggle with is if you believe there's systemic problems, are you part of the problem if you keep supporting the existing structures? If you attack them, is that really helping people? What does that do to bringing people together to a solution when those who are invested in the system, the last thing you wanna hear is it's gonna to get torn down when they built it and endowed it. So how do you think about that? How do you intervene in a world today where you've got such loud voices calling for fundamental systemic reform when you've grown up in trying to introduce people to the opportunities of the existing system. Dorothy, can I jump in for just Wait, one uh, minute? Of course. This is a Congress, I am married to a white guy. So race is a constant conversation in our household. Um, who are you? How do you identify? And my kids are, they look white. 
And so there's one child identified as black, one identified as white. Um, so the conversation breaks down to um, uh, sort of like how, oh my God, I lost my, sorry, I'm so sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, The, the child who identifies as white, um, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I've lost, totally lost my train of thought. That's okay, that's okay. Let's, let's, um, Dr. Holmes answer. Yeah, let's let Dr. Holmes give, uh, give an answer and then we can, you can um, come back. Let me, let me reformulate because I have it in there somewhere. I just have to find, <laughs> have to find, figure it out again. Um, sorry. Okay. Um, the way I would respond to Glenn is to say that the issue is not, in my view about any good effort you make to make the Williams colleges of, the, of our society available to people who otherwise wouldn't have them. That's not really the issue in my view. The, the issue, which I hinted at in my remarks was that even when people are admitted to prestigious schools, if you follow them all along the way do they have full access to full advancement all along the way? And most people of color do not. They will feel that, and it's not just people of color, it can be women, it can be other uh, groups, marginalized groups, feel that at some point that trajectory is gonna be stopped. So for example, someone might be invited on, the, uh, on a board of, of a corporation, but do they really have the opportunity to become president of the board? It's kind of like the issue of, okay, I'll invite you to the dance, but do they, but does that person get invited to dance? Right. It's about full opportunity to advance all the way to the top on the basis of, of merit. And, and, and the systemic issue is that most people of color feel that there are barriers to that in, 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 in every area. Yeah, and I guess to, to respond yeah. to that, and, and I get, and uh, I hear wait, that, wait. I would say that, but that's how I think about it traditionally, but what surprises me is how many people now are just saying, look it, you're complicit in the system. It has to be torn down. Now, and I, I, hear I know that that's I know that's a point of view, but I don't think that's really the dominant point of view. I'm going to send Pam something that she can distribute to all of you called the continuum that lays this out in terms of how groups, even like this group, can work to make sure that there's full equity, meaning opportunity all along the way to get to the top. I'm happy uh, to I, I know there are other people who wish to speak. And I, I would just say, if, in the interest of time, if, if each of us could speak briefly so that, uh, that we can um, not, not talk past the point of uh, mm -hmm. illumination into the point of exhaustion. <laughs> so I know, thank you, Dr. Holmes. I know Dan Sullivan, if he's still on, had a question and he's been um, very patient. Dan, are you still there? I know we have a couple of dance. I don't see him anymore. Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Myra. Okay. Thanks for the opportunity to show up here. It's been a great experience for me. Um, I, I, we're talking so much about systems. You know, fr systems frustrate the hell out of me because they don't change fast enough. So I have, uh, if I stuck with a system because I wanted it to change, I usually got frustrated and angry. And when I do that, I don't really think clearly. And I start pointing my finger at people and saying that you're the problem. So I've more often in my later years have focused on what I can do, how I can change. And it, an example of this would be showing up for this. I, um, I grew up in Boston. I'm an Irish Catholic, played hockey much of my life didn't hang out with black people. It was just, I didn't. So uh, I had the opportunity to go to a program 15, 20 years ago. I live in Maine, not a lot of black people in Maine. 
who knows why I moved here, right? But I had an opportunity to go to Bronxville, New York for a four-year program. Bronxville, New York. Less white people than people of color. I was scared my first year. Here I am in my 50s, I think, when I was down in my 40s. And uh, I was embarrassed. So I made a point to go with my white friends into the city on a regular basis. So I could expose myself to people of color, mostly black people. And oh my God, it was embarrassing for me to feel that. Every year I went back for two, two months a year and I would do that again. And I would do that, eventually I was less scared. So I'm thinking about Cooper versus Cooper. I wonder how often she hung out with black people. Yeah. I wonder how often he interacted with white people with dogs that were freaking pains in the ass. I just didn't have the experience. So I made it a point for me to change me. And uh, it's been pretty cool. So I, I, work, in a, I work in a business where I, I ask people to change. I'm a physical therapist. They come to me and they're in pain. They're in pain. I like this guy Baldwin. He said something about pain. Anger hides pain. Yeah, I know that. I did that a lot. And I see these people doing the same thing. Well, I don't think very clearly when I'm angry. So if I avoid that, then I have to address my pain. And uh, so I went with this guy, uh, Brooklyn, New York, Brooklyn guy, into the city on a regular basis just to hang out with people of color. And I found out that I am so narrow-minded. Well, <laughs> um, I'm getting less narrow-minded as time goes on, but I, I, I have much more reward changing me and knowing that I might bump into someone along the way that I might learn from them and also share with, my, with them my experience. I'm today expending more of my energy not yelling at the damn TV because so-and-so doesn't agree with my thoughts on uh, how the world should be run. But I spend more of my energy hanging out with people here and meeting people like this on Zoom that think differently than me. I didn't necessarily agree with everything you said, Dr. Holmes. <laughs> here are a few of my evoked responses. I'll, just, I'll end with this. Sour grapes. Competition is good. I played hockey my whole life. The winner wins. Feeling less than. I felt less than many times in my life, and I still do. Right? It's not about you putting me down. It's about me putting me down. And that, uh, that it's an interesting that I've evolved in my response to feeling less than. I don't point my finger as much at other people. And... Uh, I'll tell you something when I got, when I, this is the last thing I'll say. When I was a freshman at Williams, I felt so outclassed by every single person there. I felt lucky that I was hanging out with a bunch of smart people, but I felt way less than because I was hanging out with a bunch of smart people. Until I went over to career counseling, I said, I don't know what I'm doing here. And she asked me, what do you like to do? And I knew the answer to that question. It was, I'd like to study biology. And she said, stay with that then. And before you leave here, you're going to find out what you really like. And you're going to get a job doing that. I really feel like if we spend a lot of time paying attention to what we really are talented at, that we're going to discover how we can make ourselves better. And I, for one, uh, am changing my racist behaviors. And I appreciate you guys showing up to do that and help with me. Thank you, Sully. Appreciate it. Um, we're about at the, we're like a 928. So I want to um, uh, go ahead and uh, make a few closing remarks so that we can let um, one another go. <laughs> yeah, can I, can I make two notes before we do closing remarks? I'm gonna ask you not to Nina, cause oh. Dr. Holmes, uh, Dr. Holmes is already beyond what she oh. promised. So oh, sorry. We really are down to the last two minutes. So thank you. Um, we'll find a, a way to converse more later. Great. I just um, realized what I was trying to say. Okay. And I wrote it down and sorry. Right. Uh, Dr. Holmes, 
Um, I want to thank you once again um, for coming uh, to Williams and uh, talking uh, with us about systemic racism and uh, leading us in a, um, you know, and thinking about uh, restorative justice as a remedy. And we fully, I think, understand your message that it's not the only um, option and that it's, it's a tool. Um, I really want to thank uh, those of you who attended um, the um, discussion and presentation. We really appreciated that. We were very excited that you all were so excited and that we had such interest um, from the classes of 75 through 81. And I hope this is just the start of um, you know, something uh, new. Um, again, thanks to Mario for uh, being brave enough to ask the class of 78 to take this on. And um, Mario, is there anything you want to say? Well, first, I, I definitely would like to do, uh, thank Dr. Holmes for taking time to um, work with us this evening. But I especially want to thank you, Pam, um, for taking on this topic. As a white guy, it's easy for me to ask the question, but for you to jump in and be willing to teach me and to teach us um, and to design this program has been uh, fantastic. So I not only learned something tonight, but I've learned an um, incredible amount from you and Brent during the last uh, nine months uh, work on this. So thank you very much. And I thank all of you for showing up tonight. Um, it's just the beginning of a conversation. It's a lifelong journey. And we all start at different parts. But I think we have a lot of committed people here. And so uh, let, let's keep the ball um, going down the field, uh, step by step. And Brent, I, I didn't see Brent. I'm sure you're here. Brent, say hello, goodbye. <laughs> hello, goodbye. Thank you, everyone. It's great to be involved on the team. <laughs> Dr. Holmes, that's Brent Shea. Oh, yes. Hi, Brent. Good to meet you. If I, if I, if I, if, if, if I may say one last word of appreciation, uh, including for, for, for Dan, I don't think to, I don't think the answer is that we agree with one another. I think the answer is that we all speak up and uh, share and I noticed several comments in the chat about meeting more, meeting again. And it has been my experience on these subjects that when people meet once, no matter how evocative and productive and constructive it is, it can just go into the ether. I wish for all of you that you could find a way to maybe make this uh, even and most ambitiously, ambitiously an ongoing project. And I think you will find your way to with all the power of you people who, who are Williams strong to, to do something to help the, 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 the subject matter, because I think it, it does require going beyond the conversation. And one last point, I, I put it in the chat. I recommend to you the book Jonathan, by Jonathan Metzl called Dying of Whiteness, Dying of Whiteness by mm -hmm. Metzl, M-E-T-Z-L. He's a psychiatrist who studied deeply um, uh, uh, disgruntled, uh, disillusioned uh, former uh, workers in the Rust Belt and how they um, literally were dying because they would not sign on to uh, Obamacare because mm -hmm. it was for black people. And even if they had end-stage kidney disease, ah. they were not going to sign on for it. Ah. It's a very stunning book about um, the far reaches of systemic racism. Wow. That's killing white people. Yeah. yeah. Thank you all so much. I enjoyed being with you. Thank you, Dr. Holmes. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Mario.